your Monday. It has been a while since you have seen us, since we have seen you. I hope you've had a wonderful summer. We are back from our very long hiatus. As you can see, I have since moved and I'm in a new office. It's slowly starting to come together, so forgive it for uh, looking a little undone still. I am still in the moving in and decorating phase, so there is an office that will be developed behind me that we will be doing our new Mentor Mondays from in the future. So um, I have some unfortunate news. I'm a little brokenhearted this morning. We found out that my um, co-host and producer, Jamie Cooper, is no longer going to be able to join us on Mentor Mondays. She has a son who's been accepted to a school that's really important for her, and uh, she's got to pick him up during our broadcast. So we are not going to be having Jamie on with us going forward. Hopefully she will jump in and uh, guest host with us from time to time. Jamie, thank you for everything you've done to help us build Mentor Mondays. Thank you for your participation. You will be sorely, sorely missed. Love you and best of luck to anything you do in the future in this industry. Okay. Thank you ladies for joining us today. I am very excited. Today we have with us Katie Maxson Landis. She is a CPA. She is with Moxie Accounting out of Portland, Oregon. And today we are going to be talking about taxes. So welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Welcome to the uh, corporate extension tax deadline filing date. <laughs> oh, that's right. It was September 15th. So if you had filed an extension for your taxes, they were due. Well, they guess they're due today. On they're due day. today. They're due today. Yep. They are due for, partner for partnerships and S-corporations. They are due today. Wow. Yes. I'm glad I got my taxes dead early this year. I yeah, hate the 15th deadline. That is just so stressful. So today we're going to talk about taxes and cannabis. And I want to start this by just kind of hitting some really important points that you as a CPA now working in cannabis for two years. Is that right? Seven. I've been doing tax returns. I've been doing tax returns for Oregon uh, medical marijuana uh, folks since 2000, tax year 2012, and then 15 is when the, the rec rules changed or came to be in, in Oregon, and so I've been working with a whole group of people converting into, out, out of Oregon medical marijuana rules into regular business, uh, traditional, traditional cannabis now business, and since, you know, the 2015, so this is my, this is my, was my sixth Six-ish tax year. Well, next year is seven tax seasons in cannabis. Wow. So yeah. okay. So for for individuals throughout the U.S., what are the top three things you want them to know when it comes to filing their taxes as a cannabis business? What are three things that you've learned that are really important for people to understand? Uh, as an it well, the the top thing is you are federally illegal no matter where you are in this country period state legality does not equate in any way shape or form to federal legality obviously but what that means is when you follow federal tax law you are applying code section 280e as a federal drug trafficker and it's really important i i try to ask my clients to remember that not because they're bad people or they're, they're but that they're doing anything wrong per se. They're an emerging industry. They are trailblazing out into the world. And when you trailblaze, you are playing with fire. So there's a lot of issues from the tax standpoint that may be uncomfortable for them. It may be that they've never filed tax returns related to cannabis because they believe that they didn't need to. It may be that they're, they're, they're relying upon criminal defense attorneys or business attorneys that don't have a tax bend to their view of cannabis to, to give them advice that may or may not be helpful for them in the overall taxation structure that they are, are looking at. It might be fine for investors or getting a lease or going, you know, complying with the, the Oregon or the California or the Washington rules that the state wants to see happen. But when you're dealing with federal tax rules, you're dealing with antiquated 1986 tax law and they are treating you as a drug dealer. 
So if you just remember that the federal government sees you as that, not to freak you out, but to keep you on your toes, there's not, the federal tax position is not the place to relax and it's not the place to monkey around. So the number one and number two things I would say is A, you know, the federal tax position is far more punitive than your state tax position. And two, that, you know, you can't monkey around with it. 280E is absolutely the law of the land and there is no way around it. So three, fiscal literacy, understanding what you can and what you can't do in tax and getting a tax preparer or, or a tax advisor that's going to give you the most conservative position so that you understand that all tax law is done uh, in, a, in a gray area. How conservative your tax preparer is versus how conservative you are, you come together and you meet uh, at the baseline of law. Well, the law for 280E says no credit or deduction shall be taken. Punitive. So anytime you move off of no, which is what the IRS says as no credit, which is zero in mathematical terms, you really have to have a defensible position that you've come to, not because you're just flinging spaghetti at the wall, but because you run your business with acumen, fiscal literacy, fiscal acumen, that's gonna give you the ability to be here for the long term. Tax law is trying to put you out of business and they will be successful if you're stupid about paying taxes, period. That is quite the warning. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit more about fiscal literacy. We, were, we started to have a conversation about that before we came on here and I really kind of want you to, to share with me what your thoughts are around that. So after seven years of doing this, and I have seen all makes and walks and ages and, and, and groups be in cannabis. One of the things I like about cannabis is that it is available to everyone. And people who have taken the, again, leap into being a trailblazer are very interesting folks that are highly skilled at what they do and all came to cannabis for lots of different reasons. It's a great divided, you know, flat playing field in a lot of ways. But one of the things that they all, many of them share, is a lack of understanding basic business and basic tax. And that's not uh, uncommon for your regular nail salon or your Uber driver or your Airbnb person. It's um, not as costly to them. Right, it's not as costly when the mistake is made, <laughs> frankly. But it's very, very common. Um, when our education system isn't teaching people how to balance a checkbook, because what's that? Uh, or live inside a budget, because we have credits. Why would you do those things? So, um, you know, I what I have seen is that the number one thing that I have to educate people on is basic taxes and then basic business concepts and, and then twist it 180 degrees and put it on its ear in order to be able to understand how their chosen industry, cannabis, is currently being persecuted by the tax code. Um, every business is persecuted by the tax code. They are not special, they are not individual, it is not personal to them in a lot of ways. Um, it, it, tax law applies to all of us. I pay taxes on things that I think should be deductible and aren't. So do you, so do, you know, again, the Airbnb is the, the salon, air, um, massage therapists, lawyers, any of people. But um, so the thing that I'm coming to find is that I have, I've had seven years of dealing with tax returns and that's an entirely different animal in some ways, putting them into the tax position. But the, the most important thing right now, I think is that we need to change or address the conversation with the industry about fiscal literacy, education needs to go out, or the small DIY guy, the, the incredibly innovative person that has been the, the trailblazer for all these years is going to be swept aside by a terrible tax position, and big business is going to come in, either big pharma. Canada is doing a very good job at buying California, which is buying Oregon right now. Um, and so, you know, those are big businesses. Those are businesses, like I like what to you, say. What do you mean when you say Canada is buying California? Which when, is buying? So 
Cat Canada in July recreationalized and decriminalized cannabis countrywide. Right. It, it goes illegal in October. Right. So what what is happening is that a, a lot of Canadian companies are looking to the breadbasket of cannabis, Southern Oregon, Northern and Central California, as the place in the future that their, their big money will be made both from a genetics standpoint and just from a buying the agricultural standpoint, there have been, at least in Oregon, enough years, enough tax years for people to have gotten into business, capitalized their business, gotten a couple of two or three years of incredible tax burden, and they're selling for pennies on the dollar. Well, who's buying? Canada. Canada is coming in, Canadian IPO, companies that want to IPO, initial public offer, or Canadian companies that are currently private that have venture capital behind them or have whatever sort of monies behind them. A lot of oil and gas and a lot of gold companies are who I'm seeing. So people who are used to exploratory positions already are looking at cannabis and saying, hey, you fit our, you fit our profile. We're not risk adverse in your area. We're exploratory. We are either going to win big or we're going to go bust. And we're used to that. Not what regular business normally is, is looking for. Regular business wants returns. So what's happening is that Canada is putting is pumping a lot of money into impacting your state's legislation and how it's going to be taxed and what happens and who controls it and who the players are. So people pay attention and get involved at the local level for politics. It matters. You matter. You change things. It happens. Take it from somebody who has watched the tax code change and the, the legislation change 12 times since 2015 in Oregon. We are literally 48 months ahead of the shit show you're about to have. Let me tell you. So um, Canada is coming in and they are buying for pennies on the dollar. People who either grew cannabis in California illegally for a lot of years and see an opportunity to be able to even sell for pennies on the dollar to somebody who's willing to take it wreck because those people, they don't know where the things get. They just bought this up. They're going to put it on a tax return. They're fine. And people are getting out of the industry making money. Or those people in Oregon who have had two or three or four years of tax um, debt are saying, I can't, this isn't sustainable for me. I don't see the rhetoric change. I see the rhetoric, but nothing changing from a tax law standpoint that's going to relieve me of a tax burden. And even then, I can't go back and fix 2014, 15, 16, 17. Tax debt lives with me no matter what. I'm going to just get out. I'm going to get out. And somebody can buy my stuff for pennies on the dollar. And I... Is that what's happening in Colorado as well? I mean, we're seeing so many dispensaries and cultivation sites that are being sold off and you know my some of my colleagues and I are wondering what's going on what my, is my guess would be that the tax burden has become to the point well so you know when you're dealing with uh and we can get and, and really should get to this concept of where a where a cannabis business is taxed um when you're dealing with a gross profit tax position so you're not allowed to deduct many of the normal business expenses that drive successful business forward. Advertising, marketing, promotion, administrative sales, employees. employees. Well, at a dispensary. Um, when, you're, when you are disallowed from your selling expenses or your administrative costs, you're being taxed on money you've already spent. So that's putting you back in the hole again and again and again. And really many of the people that I have dealt with um, over the course of the years have gambled to build their cannabis business by using the federal tax debt in order to sell it to pay off the federal tax debt and hope that they've got a couple, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars in their pocket to do something else with. And what are they doing? They're trying to go be landlords for pot, a non-280E business, or leasing 
trim machines, uh, extracting machines, not a 280E business. They, they have had enough fiscal literacy to understand that when you stand sort of one ring outside of cannabis, you don't take the tax hit the same way. So I would, I would assume, and I don't know what's really happening in Colorado, but I would assume because Washington and Oregon's businesses are doing a lot of consolidation and sell-off of the original owners, uh, that, that the tax debt is playing a fundamental role in the decision-making process, without a doubt. So would you say that for to someone going in, let's say, to a dispensary situation, got a license, I got a license, I'm going to open this dispensary that the best thing for me to do is for every dollar I break in, break off my tax burden from that dollar and put it in the bank. That I have to manage every- If you can get a bank account, sure. <laughs> yes. Oh, barrier number one. Right, yeah. No, and immense, and immense barriers to entry, not just monetarily from a capitalization standpoint, uh, but from, from a, a pure administrative standpoint. I would say, I tell clients, if you can't run your business on 50 cents of every dollar, then you need to really take a look at your expectations related to cannabis. If you want to, if you're used to a hundred thousand dollar paycheck tax free, that's a hundred and about $50,000, $45,000 paycheck taxed. And if none of that is deductible, that's another $45,000 in income tax that you're going to pay on $145,000. It's this terrible iterative, uh, you know, in Excel, you have that circular equation. It becomes that so quickly that if you don't spend your time educating yourself where you can spend your money, and now, unfortunately, with the new tax code changes, whether you should be a C corporation versus an S corporation, um, you know, and it is not a slam dunk answer. There is no slam dunk answer in either tax or cannabis. Um, it always depends. But, you know, there's a lot of changes going on right now that are very big Leviathan things moving in, in the tax world alone. And then I have to try to apply them to, to cannabis, which is another mental exercise in gymnastics all, all together. Let's drill down on the first, what you just said about corporate structure, because this is really where it starts, right? This is the first real decision that you have to make in building your business. What is my corporate structure going to be? Yeah. So you said that some laws had changed. Is yeah. that in Oregon or does that affect nationwide? Federal. So the federal tax law, the tax code that came in in January, uh, for which accountants just got guidance two weeks ago. Right. We, Our new we are starting... Tax code. Yeah, we are taught. We are federal tax code changed in January. Uh, after today, I'm getting ready to do tax projections for all of my corporate and Schedule C businesses to be able to determine whether 2019 means you need to go to becoming a C corporation or not. There is there are as many opinions about what kind of tax structure or what kind of business structure you can be as attorneys out there. Uh, in the beginning, in 2012. Every attorney I talked to said that cannabis needed to be a nonprofit, which is a terrible idea. <laughs> um, not so much anymore. Is that true? Uh, then everyone said you had to be a uh, partnership. And then everyone said you had to be a C corporation. I have not liked the C corporation position for a number of reasons until recently and still Again, I am a very conser I am very conservative when it comes to dealing with cannabis because I'm dealing with a federal drug dealing position. I am a I I as a CPA have the capacity to be charged with aiding and abetting a federal criminal enterprise in filing a tax return. So you don't shenanigan with me on taxes because I'm not going to jail for this. I am willing to help be a trailblazer in this arena as well but not a, a Vader. Um, so that said, a C corporate, I, I, I believe that you need to, I as a, as a professional and attorneys as professionals need to put people in the correct entity, business entity, where their fiscal literacy lives. <laughs> if they're not capable of understanding what tax code follows a C corporation, don't go into a C corporation because you're going to blow it. A C corporation 
is a standalone entity. If we had a C corporation in the room right now, there'd be a third person sitting here with us. They pay their own taxes, which people go, oh, that's great. That money is theirs. It's not yours. You may not take a distribution or a draw or a loan out of a C corporation. It's not your money. That C corporation's first obligation is to pay its taxes. And its second obligation might be to pay its stockholders. But remember, stockholders are gonna pay, get, are gonna have, get taxed twice. First, when the dollars are taxed at the C corporation, and then when they get a distribution of all that cash you don't have because you just paid your taxes. So wages only, wages only. So if you don't have a payroll company, you better not be a C corporation because you blew it. All the money you took out, you blew it. And now you're getting double taxed on it. It's already bad enough to get taxed once at gross profit. You want to get taxed twice. That's a 70% tax burden on every dollar. It's bad enough that it might be 50. Don't blow it by, by taking an attorney, God bless attorneys, but they don't file a tax return. Don't take an attorney's view of what you need to do to have liability protection because it's not the same thing as tax protection. Two very different things. And so, so it was either a C corp or an LLC. Where does the S corporation live in all of so this? An LLC is nothing to the IRS. The LLC is a state created limited liability, again, company. It is a company made for state purposes for liability in the state, not tax liability, slip, fall, product, uh, negligence, those kinds of liability concerns, not tax liability. The IRS does not recognize an LLC. An LLC can be one guy, it can be two guys, it can be under 200 guys, it can be an infinity number of guys. If it's one guy, it's a single member LLC, which is taxed just like a Schedule C on your 1040 tax return. If it's two guys, or gals, as the case may be, if it's two gals, it's a partnership. And it files a 1065 tax return. If it's a C corporation, if it's a corporation, an LLC being asked to be taxed as a corporation, it's by, by default a C corporation. If you elect, which means ask the IRS for special permission, you have to file a second form. If you elect, you can become an S corporation. And in the ladder of tax return types, an S corporation lives kind of underneath a C corporation and just above a partnership. It shares characteristics between the two of them, but it's, it is not its own entity and an LLC is nothing. So I have people all the time say, oh, I made an LLC. And I say, how many people are in your organization because that's going to tell me where the IRS will default them. And so that's the fiscal literacy piece. If you want to be a corporation, know how to be a corporation, how to start a corporation first off. And if you don't want to be a corporation, you need to really be able to tell me how you think this, the, the, the taxation is going to work out for you it, because every single sole proprietor and partner is not a tax deduction to their business. They cannot take a wage. What you're saying when you're a sole proprietor is, I made all my money. And so the federal government says, great, we're going to tax you on all of it. Like you took it all like wages. So I really like a corporate structure for these folks, but I definitely have had clients that I have let stay a partnership for a year in order to get to do some training with them about the timing for when they take draws, what their real budget is, what they can deduct, what they can't deduct. Don't take everybody to Las Vegas, you know, for the, for the marijuana BizCon. It's not a tax deduction, period. It is a business expense for, for promoting your cannabis business. If I were to go as a tax preparer, it is a deduction for me. It is not a deduction for you, ever. It is not a deduction for you if you are a grower or a dispensary. Or a wholesaler, 
for an edibles maker or a topical maker or a plant touching business. If you traffic in a Schedule One drug, if you exchange money, services, or remuneration in any kind for marijuana, you are subject to 280E. The big five. I call them. It's the farm. It's the, the edibles, topicals. Uh, ex, you know. Uh, it, then there's the extractors. Then there's the wholesalers. Then there's the, the dispensaries. And it becomes more punitive. The tax position becomes more punitive as you move towards being a wholesaler. Wholesaler in in my tax position is the most punitive because they have the most opportunity to do shenanigans. Okay, so let's, so we've explored a little bit corporate structure. Now let's look at something I'm personally very curious about, which we've started talking here, is ancillary businesses. Uh -huh. So I want to, I've got some questions for you. I want to set up because I've actually had a few of these conversations with other people in ancillary businesses, and it seems to be very gray. So I have a client. Welcome to cannabis. <laughs> I have a client in Puerto Rico who has hired me to help them launch their business. Okay. I American territory, so subject to American tax law. I have put, um, uh, you know, I help kind of with the branding and getting the dispensary ready and all of these things. When he hired me, he was paying me out of an investment fund that he received he was not, has never been a cannabis business before. And the people who paid him, gave him the investment funds were not cannabis related. Uh -huh. So I feel confident that that original money coming to me, there's no question. It was never touched cannabis. It, I have, sure. but, but is that a correct assumption? Uh, I think from the facts and circumstances you've given me, yes. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing that's, it, that's makes cannabis so difficult in, in and around these arenas is that trafficking has a cr is a criminal definition. It doesn't have a civil definition. It doesn't have a business definition. The concept of trafficking has extended when we when we open the scope up. We're talking about pills and heroin and bad other you know things. It is literally moving. A, a, a something that's on the Controlled Substances Act without a DEA license. That is the definition. Sorry. That is the definition of trafficking. So, you know, I mean, there, there is a there is an actual criminal definition, but really what you're doing when you are, you know, selling pot for money is you are trafficking in the eyes of the federal government. Now, state clearly you know th there's a lot there's an even grayer area when you get involved with talking about medical and what states allow medical and what they what they allow with medical and uh patients and cards and amounts you need to provide back to people and reimbursement and whatever but the when money in my in my tax position as soon as you start the business of selling a federally illegal product for money, for barter, for trade, or whatever, you're trafficking. So the setup piece on all of that is, in my opinion, does not fall inside of trafficking. Now, if that that being said, I'm sure that if they, if they, whoever they are, if the federal AG, if somebody took issue with your Puerto Rican company and decided to figure out a way to make your transactional activity with them trafficking, they would succeed. Which is why all of us have to remind ourselves that we are trailblazers in the arena of drug dealing. <laughs> I have to remind myself that all the time. I can be charged, even though I'm producing a tax return, which is as far from fun <laughs> as it can, I mean, it is not weed, let me tell you. You know, so, I mean, but the, the reality is that I am, I am touching the, the aspects of an already existing economic and political system that has many years of bad policy and, and bullshit that's been propagated since the 30s related to this drug. And, 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 where, and if I stray into the wrong arena with a group of people, I'm going to be the one whose head's going to roll because I am the trailblazer. I took 
the, you know, I'm taking the risk of being involved with an emerging industry. I do that because I believe that the big sociopathic entities of the farm, big pharma and, you know, the, um, you know, Monsanto and, and, and the like are going to get here. It's going to happen eventually. And we have this brief window where the small guy gets to have and deserves to have as good of tax advice as people that can burn money all day long and have people sit around and cook up crazy, uh, you know, crazy tax positions for them to just try out because they're willing to defend it in court, you know? Um, we, the little guy deserves that. So what does that do to my tax implication? So my thought is that as long, that while the money is coming out of a bank account that has not touched cannabis, I'm not concerned. I think you have a reasonably t defensible tax position that says that you are doing, you know, ancillary services, frankly, for, you know, consulting services for a group that's exploring any number of options. As far as I'm concerned, as long as you put it on a tax return and they don't, it's, it, nobody cares. <laughs> you know, you're getting taxed on it and they're getting taxed on it again. And, and that's really where I try to counsel my clients. If I have to put it on a tax return because I'm taking it as income because I've provided a tax return to you, you need to remember you can't put it on a tax return because it's a compliance expense that's required to pay to play in the economy of the United States filed tax return. But 280E says no credit or deduction shall be taken for a business that traffics. Accounting services, it's deduction, accounting expense. It is not a cost of goods sold. And then there's all these people that want to get into, well, it's an indirect expense or it's an overhead expense or it's no credit or deduction shall be taken for a drug that, for a, a business that traffics. So if but you my, want to move off zero. My business is consulting. So yeah. my business is not trafficking. So I can go about business. I think you're fine. They need to not deduct you. And that's and because because we're moving into kind of a murky space where you know potentially my husband may be working in the industry he will be plant touching we have real estate investments you know we have there are all of these things to start to consider yeah. on a personal level once you become employed by or take money from a I like to say yeah I like to say the cannabis business is built backwards and upside down. So anything you know about regular business, you need to flip on its head and look at it with one eye and your head cut because every, there, there, it, it, there is so little law. There's so little tax law. There's so little criminal, you know, or not, there's a lot of criminal law for anybody who traffics, but there's so little law and business law between people suing each other and or, you know, and, business failures, audit failure, any number of other things that regular businesses do, contract disputes, any of that. There's so little uh, law because this industry doesn't like to take it to court because it doesn't like to take it to cops because it has a history of that being bad for them. Uh, when you, you start growing a bunch of people that don't know each other as well, as the original cannabis industry and their small pockets with good face, you know, <laughs> we're going to do a business deal. You and I both have risk. We both have a lot of incentive at being stand up about things. When you start throwing strangers together and a whole lot of money, you get a lot of predatory relationships happening. And as soon as the tax bill comes due, that's when it starts to break down. So, you know, you, every single person needs to look at those little places where they're not sure, um, does cannabis relate? Does it not relate? I do a lot of talking with people about like, let's just look at your whole, let's just look at your whole structure. For instance, a, a Colorado precedent has been made in that a dispensary owner that has, God, you know, the dispensary owner that lost their ability to be able to, lost their license, uh, could not claim bankruptcy on that business because their only asset is weed. And the bankruptcy court is not in the business of becoming a federal, federal drug dealer in order to be able to make money 
to be able to satisfy the debt on the building that they owe, which the note was called by the bank because the bank has the right, Wells Fargo and US Bank and Chase, they'll call your mortgage with 30 days notice or they'll go, they can, they have the ability to do that if you're trafficking in their building. You don't own it, they own it, it's there. So um, you can't, you can't claim bankruptcy, you can't just be discharged in that. Um, you can't just get your federal tax debt discharged through offering compromise or, or the like the same way because you are you have strayed into an entirely different arena that makes you a bad guy in the eyes of these authorities. So that's why the clients that I work with, my number one priority and goal is conservative, consistent from year to year, defensible. Because you know what we're going to have to do? Take it to court and win. Take it to court and win. If you don't have the balls to take it to court and win, you're not helping your industry. If you're not working with a tax professional, an EA, a licensed tax preparer, you, you know, you're not. You're not going to do for your industry what you need to do. It is possible to win, I believe in this arena, but you have to have documentation. You have to be conservative, consistent with the tax position you take, and you have to be ready to go to court, which means you might have to spend more money than you want to be the next champs case. My God, if the champs people didn't go to court, we'd be screwed on tax law. They did for the industry, even all of the commissioner, he lost, but he created incredible precedent, any precedent, by not burning receipts and being there to answer questions and be explicit about what was happening. He's done. He did. They, those people did huge service for the industry. And if you're just wanting to turn and burn a bunch of black market chum into this thing, make your $400,000 and get out, please do it quickly. Because people like me who want to be professionals and people like you who want to be professionals and keep this industry moving forward for those people that really want to help people and change the world. We need those people out of here right away. Sarah, do we have any questions or comments for Katie? Not as of yet. No, we don't. So, do it's you tax. No one's watching. No one wants to know about tax. Tax is well, our, our tax episodes get watched. Oh, all right. Well, yes, we had I mean, several hundred views on our last. That's why I want I, 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 am. Uh, you know, my, my team and I are putting together for a, hopefully a fourth quarter launch for a fourth quarter launch. Yeah. You know, I want to change this conversation around tax because it's so scary, and because people don't know where to start. And we, and and, and I want to put. To, I'm putting together boot camps that are that are roadmap consultations. I want you to tell me where you're at with questions and it, me asking you questions and find out where your fiscal literacy is. So I can say, okay, this group on average is a three out of 10. I got to start way back down the road or, oh, I have a group of people that are eights out of 10. Let's start talking stock bases. Let's talk about investors. Let's, you know, all these things that would just make your head swim so that you can take, you can listen to these questions, answer them for yourself, go through a two-day process, I hope, that's interactive. You can have a conversation with big, scary CPA people ah, that sign your tax return. Let's talk. Let's talk. Tax is all about facts and circumstance based, just like with law. you got to be able to make the arguments. And then at the end of the day, take that same list of questions and say, gosh, is my score better? <laughs> do I need to do I need more understanding about this that and the other thing because people in cannabis care about other people there's a whole population of the medical people that are being overrun yep. by the people that are getting ready to have it be the next piece of tobacco or alcohol and if these little people don't get some help they're gone they're just gone it's true and and it you know we're looking at why these things happen and you're right business acumen and financial literacy are you know and people the will bring their um, money issues into their business and Absolutely. they will 
replicate their issues with money. And it's yeah. dangerous to do that in this industry because yeah. I had no idea you couldn't file for bankruptcy. I mean, but yeah. it makes sense. I yeah. get it. The federal government doesn't want to try and offload a bunch of cannabis. Well, they won't. They literally won't. The tax that the, they, they are not in that. That is a choice that you made to be done. They'll seize it. <laughs> They'll seize it and you can't take a tax deduction for that, but they're not going to sell it on your behalf. Let me tell you. So, you know, I mean, that's, that is also a problem is that federal seizure laws are, are still very antiquated. And in some ways we need the government to move slowly and not make, you know, snap decisions about things, especially when it relates to social uh, benefit in the country. But in some ways we need them to move a little bit faster. And I think they're not moving fast because no one ever, not in my lifetime, did I ever think that pot was going to be legal anywhere, in any way, shape, or let alone an industry. I mean, uh, to it is a global industry. Well, and then here's the thing. So that's what, to answer your question way back, Canada. So when Canada legalized countrywide, what Canada gave itself the ability to do is to list on the American stock markets, Canadian public companies that, that make their money selling weed. But American companies cannot because you cannot list on the American stock exchange if you are doing something illegal in the country that you operate in. So Canada is getting ready to hand us our economic backsides for a number of years because all they have to do is sit and wait and buy our infrastructure pennies on the dollar. People are concerned about the Chinese or the Japanese buying, you know, real estate in the United States or holding our debts. This is a far bigger problem given that the, that the California world economy is fifth in the world, like, I mean, Canada's like 10th or something. Like, Canada just bought the fifth largest economy in one of the fastest growing things we're going to see in the next decade. And they're just quietly just slurping it up. So Canada is buying California. California is buying Oregon. Um, because Oregon is, and I'm sure they're buying Washington. I don't have any clients in Washington. I don't, I don't do a lot of interstate work mostly because I am working in, in Oregon. I have an Oregon license. I, I work in Oregon. California's tax rules are, are going to be very different. They're, um, I, I made mistakes in early tax returns here because tax law changed and I didn't take advantage of things or, or had to amend. And, and I'm not, I don't want nexus with California. I want to have conversations about fiscal literacy, which is the federal general piece because California businesses are gonna be more versed at California state tax law and what you have to do with sales tax and compliance tax and all those sorts of things than I ever would be. But the federal position is what you're gonna to have to defend. And you so, need to be in relationship with your California taxing authorities because they're the ones that are standing in front of you. They're the bureaucracy defending you against the federal government by, by enacting these laws. So follow your state laws and get them on your side. Follow your state, know your state legislators, talk, show up, act, go to these things, influence stuff. You know, they're, they don't know what they're doing and policy is made by, leg by lobbyists. Get in there and talk to them. They don't know. They don't know so, how to run a cannabis business. Period. Let's talk a little bit about our, our employees and the positions that they're in. So if I work at a dispensary, mm -hmm. And I take my paycheck, whatever form I get, and I go to my Wells Fargo bank to put it in there. Do I need to let Wells Fargo know that I'm now receiving money from a cannabis business? Is I being paid working at a You need business? to not lie if they ask. But I don't have to dis disclose that. No, not that, I, not that I'm aware of. Again, I'm not a lawyer, so from Just a tax standpoint, I mean, again, it's... Okay, it's, so that's a legal uh, question. I, I mean, I think that's a legal question if... The business owner is going to Wells Fargo, trying to get a bank account to run payroll, and That's they yeah. they do they do a background check or they do some sort of piece of work and ask point blank, you know, is your ABC Inc. 
the cannabis business and they go, no, don't do that. Yes. So, but for the employees, let's stick on the employee because we don't, we've talked a lot about business in, in a couple of different interviews I've done. I don't think the employee has a problem with that. They're just an employee. It's, it's a uh, trafficking. I mean, again, anyone. On their tax return, they have no issue. It's, no, they're not trafficking. They're being paid. That's a wage. Trafficking comes in the form of business. So okay. business, a business is trafficking. Now, if he's growing five plants in his basement and he's selling it on the street corner, he's also yeah. trafficking. But, yeah. you know, that's, uh, that's not what, if you have a wage, if you have a job and you're putting that, that's the first line item on tax return. It's taxed already. It should, in, in withholding has happened. Social Security and Medicare has been withheld and paid to the government, we hope. Um, and the federal government runs on Social Security and Medicare, so that's what they want. They timely file it. The number one thing I see uh, anybody, cannabis businesses getting behind is on payroll taxes, and they will come for you. They will come for you for payroll taxes. They will might not care if you're trafficking or not. The state will come for you for payroll taxes. Your people are probably not independent contractors to you. They are, if you control when they show up, what they do, you provide the services, the, the materials that they use to do their job, and they don't have any risk of not being paid, they're employees, and you better pay them as employees. That's what the federal government wants, employees, employee taxes. So we've got the business we've got the employee and we've got the ancillary business that mm -hmm. helps that business run. Sure. Is there any other kind of category that we've missed? Because each one of those is in some degree interacting yeah. with the business, whether it's the business itself or the interaction of, and each of them has a different type of tax liability based on whether they're hired as an independent contractor, like right. you and I are as a vendor, um, whether they're a business, whether they're employed. Is there anybody that we're missing in this consideration? Yeah, well, there is. Um, and it's the investor pool. Ah, yes. It's the investor pool. Because investors uh, also are, are, are scrabbling. Those people that missed the dot-com boom are scrabbling to get into the, the cannabis uh, emerging industry. Guess what? We all know it's not emerging. It's been here a long time. <laughs> it's Jen Ju and Jen. It's self police and regulated itself a lot, and it's now trying to fit into this pay to play mentality that the American economy has, which is taxes and license and structure and all you know all of these sorts of, of administrative costs that these regular cannabis businesses before when they were in the un uh, the non traditional uh, economy, frankly, uh, weren't, weren't having to deal with. So I think the investor pool, uh, either uh, angel, venture, family, stranger, whatever, the investor population is another group of people that both need a lot of fiscal literacy. And they're the ones that are come, that are also going to come back, again, from a contract standpoint dispute, from a uh, not getting the return on an investment, from not having their same fiscal literacy understanding. Um, we got to be a partner because I'm going to be a limited partner with you know, that self-employment, it could kill you if you're going to get, you know, uh, some amount of money distributed to you on a K-1, but you're never going to receive cash because they don't have any. <laughs> you know, the, the expectations of investors, I think, is really difficult because the model should be high risk, high return. The problem with cannabis is high risk, no cash flow. High so risk, high tax, no cash flow. Very difficult cash flow tax burden on somebody who is now i've lent money i am now making interest on that money which is being used to fund this illegal business as long as they put it on a tax return i think they're okay an interest only investor is not what i'm talking about i'm talking okay. about a, that is an interest only investor the, the, the dream interest only invest, invest, investor is going to give you a long term over a low interest rate and not want equity. I'm talking about the equity, the pseudo equity investors. I'm talking about the, the I mean, again, I deal with a lot of clients that come out of the black market, translate out of that untaxed market. You know, they're saying, oh, well, I've got this partner and this partner, and then I got this guy off the books. It's like, 
guess what? There's no such thing as a guy off the books. They're either on the books or they're not on the books. Well, I'll just take the distribution and pay them back personally. Okay, well, then that's different, but they're not an investor. They don't have any rights. They're not, they shouldn't be looking for a return. And it's that guy that's always the problem. It's that guy that's always got the sidebar agreement. Um, you know, it's that guy that's gonna that's gonna want their taxes paid, their tax liability paid for out of somebody else's cash flow piece. You know, it's that guy that wants to remain out, you know, in this untaxed market instead of coming all the way in for whatever reason. They've got a disability payment. They're on Social Security. They've got, you know, they can't go over some amount or they pop into a minimum required distribution for their um, you know, their, their pension or whatever, you know, it's having conversations with your investors about their expectation for return on their investment is super important. And it is a fun, it is, I'm going to teach a whole class on being able to have that kind of a conversation because the tax implication to an investor is not zero. There's no such thing as zero in Canada. Unless you are a C corporation and then guess what? Your stock is probably worth shit nothing. So if you want to get money out of this, you have to take risk. And yet there's a whole population of investors in this country that are day trading, uh, you know, stock exchange buying guys that are used to put my money in, get my investment back, have no risk. That is not cannabis. There is a risk on every single doorfront. And the question is, what is your risk tolerance? Are you risk seeking? I don't want a client that's risk seeking. They're going to take it take, you know, uh, make decisions that I don't think are good. But I want someone who has a risk tolerance profile that's capable of being, of understanding that the risk to return has to pencil out, both for their time, for the corporation's time, for the business's energy, for all of those sorts of things. And, 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 and taking $100,000 from your uncle with a 25% return because you're going to pay it back in six months will not happen it will not happen you know and and it just creates a, a load of problems investors really you know that for a hot minute in oregon there were was venture capital and then they realized oh my god a they can't control these people and b they're not going to get the return they want so i'd be really really skeptical of taking angel investment venture capital uh just an equity partner in um without those people understanding what they're getting what they're getting involved with Wow, that's a lot. I had not considered at all the investor aspect of it, but that's really important as well. Thank you for shedding some light on that, Katie. So you are, we've got a few minutes left and I just wanna give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about your education program that you're launching. Um, so what, yeah. what it covers, when it's available and how we find out more. Sure, so um, we are, my team and I are in the process of putting together uh, either one day, two day, or two and a half day boot camps that are going to have a focus for roadmap consultations is what I'm calling them in some ways. The focus is going to be on the, starting the conversation with the industry right now, because my firm belief is that if I help to educate the industry people, they're going to be able to go to the local tax preparer or their uh, find a CPA, and they're going to have enough fiscal literacy to be able to engage that person and become a good client. I want each of the big five, I call them the five industries, to be able to have a two-day workshop where they can we can assess where they are and start that process and go, great, here's what a tax return position looks like. Here's how you keep receipts. Here's how you put things together in order to be able to get both managerial information so you know what you're doing, but at the end of the day, in my world, all roads lead to a tax return. I'm a CPA, all roads lead to a tax return. And managerial accounting and cost benefit and break even and blah, 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 I don't care. I want you to be able to have the right kind of work papers, the right kind of documentation. Why? Conservative consistent, defensible, <laughs> so we can go into court if we need to. And your tax preparer feels comfortable working with you. They don't just turn around and go, oh, uh, you're a drug dealer. I don't want to deal with you at all. They go, oh, this is an emerging industry. Yeah, I have a lot to learn. Who taught you how to do it? Oh, this CPA? Oh, well, maybe I'll call her up and see what kind of classes she's teaching. The industry will follow once the, my, my industry, the professional industry will follow 
once the cannabis industry knows what its public is. And, and you can't just walk into this and hope you can go to your CPA once a year, or you can find anybody on, you know, February 28th to file you a tax return on March 15th. It happens every year to me. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you need to start now. You need to start now in fourth quarter. You guys have nine months of books and records that I guarantee you, you've done nothing with. You've done nothing with them. And the, the reality is that you don't, I don't remember what I did two weeks ago, let alone January. How are you going to quantify your income? Do you remember what your investors say? You know, it's it, it, where things are going. You have to shift from this, this non-traditional market mentality that says, burn your receipts, keep no documentation. That's when it's going to keep me safe to a mentality that says, keeping my documentation, keeping my receipts, tracking my income, having due diligence, having good controls is what's going to make it defensible so that I can move this industry forward into the future. And we together can keep some small semblance of this when the, the, you know, the, the lid comes off and Marlboro's in here or Monsanto or somebody's got a patent on every single strain and you need to be able to go back to tax returns and say, wait a minute, I've got metric for where's my bike, Gorilla Glue. Like, no, you can't possibly own that thing because I've been doing this for this long. If you want to sell your business, I guarantee you, you won't unless you have due diligence. Regular industry is not going to come in and give you your $10 million if you can't show them that you did a tax return last year. It happens all the time. And it's, uh, I mean, I, I am working currently with an extracting company that just got bought by a Canadian company for $11 million because their top line last year was $4 million. But they wanted to have all these conversations about, oh, QuickBooks Online and blah, blah, blah. And I said, excuse me, sir, uh, I know you work for eBay and we think you're all that a bag of chips, but my client did, ten, did $4 million in cash last year with no bank account. Uh, no, you have to change your mentality. Here, we're dealing with these big dudes that come in and say, oh, we're going to have a month-end close. Close of what? <laughs> uh, they can't bank here still. They're not, you know, there's a lot of things going on. Um, but so the, the goal is to put together one two-day boot camps, fiscal literacy, so you have, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring me probably a tax attorney because they're all, we stray into these attorney questions. And I want there to be this actual conversation. I want my profession to be less scary. Um, and, you know, the, the website is currently being revamped for that. I'm going to start putting together uh, Tax Tip Tuesday, little five minute bits for cost of goods sold. Or, and I'm going to do War Story Wednesday because, oh my God. <laughs> The worst After story. seven years of doing this, I we could sit down and have a beer, and you would I could blow your mind. So you know, it's they're just they're, this is a fascinating industry, and I want more professionals to get into it. And so the biggest takeaway I think is please be professional to help me and you get professionals because the professionals are what's going to keep you safe in this bureaucratic soup. And in and if you don't. If you, de if you behave like a dealer, they're going to treat you like one. So we have to stop that mentality. And the women are the ones that my five best clients are all women. And so, you know, what I, I've decided uh, unilaterally that all my workshops are going to be, uh, and, um, and conferences are going to be 17.6% less for women. Less cost. Because you know what? That's the paid gap. And if we're losing, uh, if we're losing women in the industry at, you know, the upper corporate level, you gotta get the ladies to do it. So that's, that's the goal. Fantastic. You can email that. contact at Moxie Accounting, M O X Y, M O X Y Accounting.com, um, mm -hmm. or you know, Facebook me. I'm on the Women Entrepreneurs Group, or or what have you. So happy to. And have when you're that. when you're ready to launch, we'll be promoting it through the group, ladies. So yeah. Keep an eye out. Yeah, no, I, I would like to actually do, uh, uh, you know, a women's entrepreneur, you know, for this Facebook group, either closed webcam. I, I like the dynamic of a group of people getting together. It, it creates such a different learning environment than when we do. This is great, but, um, you know, I, uh, the, the, the work that I've done where you actually get to have that synergy come together, 
some little question ruffles through the group and it, it benefits everybody for sure. Yeah, I agree. And there is no such thing as a stupid question in tax. It's it's very, very complicated. And there's no reason that you should you should know it by yourself. And don't try to do it by yourself. Ask questions, please. Please. That's what professionals are for. I try it. I'm trying to do that. So. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for joining us on another information-packed hour. I really <laughs> learned a lot. I mean, it's just every time we talk, it's just kind of peeling another layer and getting another bit of understanding of that yeah. financial literacy, even though we absolutely still need to work with a CPA who is very well-versed in cannabis. It only benefits us and the relationship we have with the CPA to at least have kind of a basic knowledge of what it is we need to do, how we talk with the CPA, the right questions to ask, yep. how we set up our books, all of these, having that awareness is really, really critical because it, it makes it an easier job for the CPA to guide you in the right way. You, well. The more you touch your paperwork, the, the less expensive a me always is, period, without a doubt. Right. Well, thank you very much, Katie. Yeah. And ladies, if you want to reach out to Katie, you can reach her at K, is it K-T-Y-E at M-O-X-Y dot com? K-A, K-A-T-Y-E. So Kat, yay, Katie, K-A-T-Y-E at Moxie Accounting or contact at moxieaccounting.com. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. I look forward to having you back soon. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, ladies, that's it for us today. Thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to seeing you again next week for our next Mentor Monday. Have a great and productive week. We'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.